Gas giants are often thought of as being inhospitable to life, especially the ones in our solar system. They're situated well outside the habitable Goldilocks zone and the lack of a solid surface combined with heavy convection currents gives very few opportunities for the precursors of life, let alone life itself, to settle down. Life needs some level of stability not only to thrive but to originate in the first place. This didn't stop the renowned Carl Sagan himself and his colleague Edwin Salpeter to speculate on the possible existence of life in the clouds of Jupiter as early as 1976. So could life stand a chance on such a hostile, dry and gaseous world after all? And how do these decades old models and hypotheses hold up against what we have learned about this majestic titan of a planet in the meantime? Let's find out! A giant gas planet like Jupiter does not seem to host an environment conducive for abiogenesis, let alone for the kind of life as we know it to be able to sustain itself. Jupiter is almost literally a world of fire and ice, with its relatively thin atmospheric layer sandwiched in between its superheated depths and the freezing cold of space. On Earth we are familiar with so-called extremophiles, tiny life forms that not only can survive either boiling temperatures or frigid cold, but often even remain metabolically active. This seems nothing compared to the extremes anything floating in the clouds of Jupiter would be subjected to. Apart from that, extremophiles are highly evolved to cope with their adverse circumstances. But before life could ever get to such a state, it would first need to originate and procreate in conditions that are much more benign. Any earliest life forms anywhere would be relatively fragile and need thousands if not millions of years to become more robust. At that stage, there is only one way to survive in the long term, that is by producing enough offspring so that at least a fraction would be lucky enough to live to see another day and create the next generation. And that gives a glimmer of hope for the Jupiter scenario. The pioneer mission of the early 70s and the flood of new knowledge it provided on the outer solar system inspired Carl Sagan and his colleague Edwin Salpeter to ponder against all odds the possible existence of life on Jupiter itself. At first thought, one cannot think of a place more different from Earth than this gargantuan planet. Its raging atmosphere has a completely different composition, with no free oxygen whatsoever. However, as the two scientists noted, Jupiter's atmosphere is actually quite similar chemically to Earth's early atmosphere, which was dominated by hydrogen and therefore reducing rather than oxidizing, forming simple compounds like ammonia and methane. With both lightning and solar radiation providing energy, the maelstrom of the Jovian clouds could easily facilitate the mass production of more complex chemical compounds. And data from the Pioneer mission showed Jupiter's clouds are rife with particulate matter. The problem is that any complex molecules and aggregated particles made of these, alive or not, would eventually be torn apart again when entering the hotter lower layers. So on the surface, pun not intended, the spark of life would seem to be prevented from ever occurring. Sagan and Salpeter tackle these issues head on with 18 pages chock full of science using a plethora of formulas and models based on the latest scientific insights of the time. First they deal with the notion that the early Earth would be much more suitable for abiogenesis, pointing out that the complex molecules formed back then would also have had limited lifetimes. The big question is how limiting these lifetimes are in the convective purgatory of Jupiter. Using their extensive modeling of the atmosphere and the latest data, they infer that not only are complex molecules continually being produced, they could also in principle remain intact long enough for life to come into existence and thrive there. And this may even be the case now. So how on Jupiter did they pull that off? So Sagan and Salpeter's model of Jupiter's atmosphere looks like this. With air pressure increasing linearly with depth, it's divided into an upper mesosphere and a lower troposphere, demarcated by a tropopause in between. 
In the mesosphere, which is mostly transparent, the average temperature is about 150 degrees Kelvin, which is minus 120 degrees Celsius or minus 190 degrees Fahrenheit. And it dips somewhat when nearing the tropopause. Below the tropopause, temperatures increase linearly to thousands of degrees in the depths. High in the mesosphere, complex compounds are synthesized as a result of solar radiation, causing photolysis of methane, which then recombines into convoluted hydrocarbon chains. These larger and heavier molecules will tend to sink downwards depending on air currents. The fusion of these molecular products by eddies decreases exponentially with altitude, meaning that the highest concentrations would be just above the tropopause. Going deeper and into the troposphere, rising temperatures will first lead to the condensation of ammonia clouds forming at the higher levels, followed by water clouds further down. There is a narrow zone with temperature conditions at around 25 degrees Celsius or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Then at the deeper scorching layers, hot clouds of heavier elements like ammonium chloride and silica would occur. And in the deep end, total destruction of any complex compounds again. It's shown how ammonium chloride crystals could be drifting upwards from lower levels of the troposphere and then act as cores or nuclei for the condensation of water droplets. It's critical that the droplets shouldn't grow too large, otherwise they'll just fall down as rain when moving to higher levels. They should stay small enough to be carried further upwards again. If this is the case, the droplets, saturated with salts and complex compounds, could act as tiny laboratories for creating life, given enough time. And according to their model, any precursor molecules to life that are produced could stay in circulation for hundreds or even thousands of years, not far from early conditions on Earth. So by assessing Jupiter's physical and chemical characteristics, including chemical reactions and convection patterns, the creation of life on Jupiter is made quite plausible. A further line of evidence is based on the mysterious colorations of Jupiter's aspect manifesting as various brighter zones and darker belts, not in the least the great red spots. Even today, we still aren't completely sure exactly what causes these variations in color. Sagan and Salpeter, director, focus on the possible nature of the presumed chromophores responsible for the hues of blue, brown and especially red. The seemingly most likely candidate, polymeric sulfur, is discounted by the duo. Chemical products resulting from reactions involving methane and hydrogen in simulated conditions seem to fit the light absorption patterns much better. They build a compelling case for the existence of not only complex organic compounds in Jupiter's atmosphere, but perhaps even biological processes. To quote them from their article, We therefore find ourselves led unexpectedly to the hypothesis that the Jovian chromophores are biological in origin and that there is an abundant biota in the Jovian clouds. So assuming the red colorations are biological in origin, they speculate further on the possible nature of these hypothetical organisms that would be suspended in the Jovian clouds. Sagan and Salpeter compare the Jovian environment with the ocean on Earth, where organisms would tend to sink to the bottom unless they can keep their density low. The only option is then reproducing as fast as possible with the hope that at least some percentage of offspring is lucky enough to be moved to higher layers by upwelling or, in the case of Jupiter, updrafts. These Jovian organisms are called sinkers. Another class of organisms would start to specialize in bringing their density down to avoid sinking to lower levels and could do this by taking in lighter elements such as hydrogen. These so-called floaters are envisaged to eventually swell into balloon-like forms. Their weight could be decreased continuously by pumping out the heavier helium in favor of hydrogen, or they could heat their internal gas stores much like a hot air balloon. It's even inferred that some of the floaters could grow to sizes many kilometers across. Both sinkers and floaters could either get their energy from the chemicals produced in the atmosphere, as chemoautotrophs, or use photosynthesis to get energy directly from the sun, as photoautotrophs. 
The best place for a photosynthesis would be in the upper troposphere, just above the water clouds, where temperatures and pressure are actually quite mild. Another way of life would be eating other organisms or their remains, as so-called heterotrophs. This could either happen as passive filter feeding or active hunting. The latter niche would be termed hunters, and these creatures would need more elaborate senses and be self-propellant in order to seek out prey. Sinkers, floaters and hunters would thus mainly make out the ecology of this strange world. As fascinating as all of this may sound, we have to remember that it was proposed in the mid-70s when we were just getting more detailed information about Jupiter. After decades of research, models have been adjusted quite a bit, although perhaps not significantly. Yet, following missions to Jupiter have not revealed any signs of life there, or even on the chemically quite similar Saturnian moon of Titan. Not yet, in any case. Nevertheless, when it comes to water content, Jupiter actually has much better odds for habitability than Venus, according to recent studies. I personally suspect that tiny droplets floating in air might actually be beneficial for proto-life, compared to a vast, diluting, primordial soup. Since the droplets could act as cells, you'd be skipping the initial need for cell membranes to keep metabolites together and such. Maybe somewhere in the universe there are sapient species discounting the emergence of life on terrestrial planets covered in water for those exact reasons. Of course, habitability for any gas giant would probably increase tremendously inside the Goldilocks zone. In another video, I will speculate more on what kinds of life forms we may expect to find on a gas planet, if not Jupiter. Make sure you don't miss that one, so please subscribe and hit the bell icon. For now, thanks for watching, cheers and bye bye!